had to be in the house of God once again just to give him praise and thanksgiving for his many blessings in our lives. We don't take him for granted. We don't take his blessings for granted. He's just been too good to each and every one of us. Amen. I just believe, amen, that if we could just learn to be faithful to him like he's been faithful to us. There'd be so many blessings that God would continue to uh, give to us, to bring into our lives. So we honor him and we thank God uh, for just as many, many blessings. Thank God for a wonderful and beautiful day. Amen. We, we can come and give praises and glory and honor to God. So we thank him today once again for just being here. Uh, another opportunity to share the word of God, which we need so desperately for our lives. We need the word of God. The thing is, people don't realize how desperate we need God. But we need him. Every ounce of us need God. Every ounce of our being needs God. So we thank him uh, for his faithfulness in our lives. For all that he continues to do. Amen. Thank God for his many, many blessings. So we're going to get into the word. We're not going to, if the Lord says the same, we don't intend to be long today. But we do want to uh, give you what the Lord has given us to share. This particular message that God has given us, I recognize that it's not something that we can share in one sermon. So we don't intend to rush because we want to share with you the things that I believe will bless your life and what God has given us. Amen. With that, I'm going to begin reading in Exodus, the 19th chapter, uh, verses 1 through 6. And I also want to read uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, a few verses there in chapter 7, uh, verses 6 through 9 of Deuteronomy. Beginning in Exodus 19, the scripture says to us in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, or they were, were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, looking very quickly to Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, Deuteronomy 7. Verses 6 and 9. No, excuse me. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. Excuse me. Uh, verses 9 through 12. And the scripture reads as follows. Verse 9 says, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land. And in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about and instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Verse 11 says, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him. And there was no strange God with him. Thank God for your patience and the reading of those scriptures. And with those scriptures having been read, I want to 
share with you part two of the message entitled, A Celebration in the Wilderness. A Celebration in the Wilderness. Let's bow our heads, precious Father, we thank you now for your many, many blessings. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for the mercies that you've given us, your mercies which are new every day, which we're so undeserving of. But God, yet you're faithful. And so we say thank you, God, for all that you have done in our lives, all that you will continue to do. Thank you for your presence in this place right now. And now, Lord, as your word goes forth, I pray, God, that you would anoint me afresh from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. And now the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. We give you praise for it now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Praise our God. Amen. We're going to get right into the word that God has given us. Once again, the message entitled, A Celebration in the Wilderness, Part 2. As I pointed out in Part 1 of this message, I again ask that you pay very close attention to the symbolism and parallels that we can draw from the text of Exodus 19, uh, verses 1 through 6 for our own lives. Because the text provides an important reminder to us of God's eyes of protection and hand of protection in our lives, especially at times when it feels like he doesn't see us, or when it feels like sometimes that he's not around, or when it feels like sometimes you cannot detect his presence. But in consideration of those who did not hear part one of the message, I do want to reiterate some of the points made in part one because I believe that the points are very important. So with that, I want to emphasize that in verse one, the scripture conveys, that is of Exodus 19 and one, the scripture conveys to us that the children of Israel had gone forth the children of Israel had gone forth. And the reason that I want to emphasize this point is because sometimes, due to the many challenges of our lives, we often fail to see the progress that we have made in our lives. And because of this, we tend to be less appreciative of the fact that at least we are moving forward and that we are indeed going somewhere with Christ. And though not all the time do we understand where we are going forward to, due to our being a continual work in progress, but often we can still sense that God is indeed taking us somewhere. But God says to us in Jeremiah 29 and 11, that I know the plans that I have for you, and that those plans are not to harm you, but they are plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. And in the case of the children of Israel in this text, we see that God's plans were to move them forward out of the land of Egypt to a land that he promised them that was flowing with milk and honey. That is the land of Canaan. And so I want you to realize today that God has also promised, made a promise for your life. And we should appreciate him for that promise as well. Even though sometimes we find ourselves in what seems to be a wilderness place. And this is another moment where I want to pause because before the Israelites would come into their land of promise, the Bible lets us know that they had come forth out of Egypt, which represented a place of bondage for them. This provides an example to us of why it is important that we simply take the time from complaining about what we don't have and about what is not going right and about what has not yet been done to tell God thank you for what he has already done in our lives. Because this verse makes clear to us 
that not only have the children of Israel gone forth, but that they are no longer in that place of bondage of Egypt. They had moved on from this particular place. But sometimes we realize that just as quickly as God has brought us out of a particular place, that the enemy is already planning, planning another assault on our lives. This is also represented in the text in verse 1 as well because the verse goes on to say that the same day that they had gone forth out of the land of bondage, out of the land of Egypt that is, that they came into a wilderness of Sinai. And as I have emphasized in part 1 of this message, when the Bible speaks of the wilderness, we must understand that metaphorically speaking, as well as literally speaking, it is usually referring to a place that represents the tests and the trials and struggles of our lives. And so as we keep in mind what the wilderness represents, I want you to also notice that in verse 2, the Bible conveys to us that the children of Israel even pitched in the wilderness. I believe this to be important because this allows us to see that the Israelites had to stay there in the wilderness a while. They pitched in the wilderness, the Bible says. This is even another moment where I would like to pause because it represents the fact that sometimes when we come into the wilderness, type of place in our lives, it often seems that we have to stay there too long. No one wants to stay in a place where there's so many trials, especially when it seems like those trials, trials in our lives are getting the best of us. No one wants to stay in a place of struggle. But we want to see ourselves moving forward. And so sometimes the wilderness place is a place sometimes where it seems uh, that we stay too long. This is the reason that God had me to tell you today that sometimes we must learn how to celebrate even in the wilderness. Even when it seems like we have been there too long. Even when it seems like the struggle is getting the best of us, we still got to know how to celebrate God even in that place. Because no matter how bad our situations are, God is yet always good. He's still good, even on what may seem to be your worst day. God is still good. So he's still worthy of celebration, even in your wilderness place. And this is important because it is imperative that we come to a place in our walk with God and in our process of maturing in the things of God, uh, that we learn how to celebrate in such a place, that we have a mind to celebrate and to rejoice and to keep our joy even in such a place. Because as I've said to you already, God is still good regardless of what is going on in our lives. And so, as I have did in part one of this message, I want to remind you that even though the area of Sinai, this desert, even though it represented this desert place, I want you to keep in mind that it also was one of the most sacred places in Israel's history. This is the reason that I want to reemphasize this once again. This place of Sinai was a sacred place. And one of the reasons that this is true it's because it is also the place where Moses met God in a burning bush. And of course, this is not an experience that Moses would easily forget. And so I wonder, is there anyone who can remember the place where you met God? Or perhaps what was going on at the time of your life when you met God? Because you, you see, in the context of God appearing to Moses in this burning bush, the people of Israel had been crying out to God to be rescued from their misery as slaves in Egypt. They had been crying to God. 
because they were suffering as slaves in Egypt. See, sometimes when we suffer, that's the time when we will cry out to God. We will cry out to God when we're going through, as I said, struggles in our lives. So again, uh, the Israelites had been slaves in Egypt. This is why the point in verse 1 is so significant about them coming forth out of Egypt. Because the scripture reminds us that God heard their cry. And he was ready to free them. This is what he conveyed to Moses. That he was ready to free the slaves, these Israels that were in Egypt, because they had been crying out to God. Sometimes when we cry to God and, and God doesn't show up immediately, sometimes we feel that God doesn't hear us. But we see in the case of the children of Israel, God called to Moses. And let him know that he had heard the cries of the children of Israel. And so right there, I want to take a moment to you and tell you don't stop crying unto God. Even when it feels like you're in a desperate place and it seems like sometimes maybe God isn't even hearing you. But keep crying unto God because we know, the scripture lets us know that he hears the cries of of the righteous. So again, I want you to pay specific attention, particular attention to uh, what is going on in the context of this message. God first had to reveal himself to Moses in a way which there would be no question in the mind of Moses that it was God who was showing up in this particular bush. So God did so by appearing in a bush that was burning. But there was something that was so strange because though the bush was burning, it was not being consumed. In this sacred moment of Moses' life, God revealed himself to him as the God of the children of Israel who was aware of the afflictions that they were enduring. And again, that he was coming to deliver them. And not only that, but Sinai is also the place where God made his covenant with Israel and where Elisha heard God's still small voice. And not least of all, it was the place where God gave his people the laws and guidelines for right living. That is, living in a way that would please him. And so now, understanding that context, I want you to notice verses 3 and 4 of Exodus 19, our foundational text, where the scripture reveals that God called unto Moses out of the mountain, saying, Thou shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. He had taken them through all of what they had been through, because God wanted to bring them to himself. You see, with all this in mind, it should give us all reason to be more committed to giving God praise for the simple fact that, like Israel, we are not where we used to be. You see, they had come out of Egypt. God had brought them forth out of that place and was now taking them to a place that he had yet promised to them. But though God has, some, has sometimes brought us forth, there are still some people who will still try to hold us hostage to where he's brought us from from the place, from a time that God has forgiven us for. All the people will want you to stay in that place. And if not physically in that place, uh, they wanna, want you to have the mindset that you are there. But as I've said to you before, we're not going back. We got to have the mindset that we're not going back to where God has brought us from. This is the mindset that we ought to have. Regardless of what 
is happening in our lives, we ought to be yet thankful in the process of God bringing us out. That is the reason that I've said to you before that we must know for ourselves who we are in God. And that the only necessary validation that we need is from God himself of who we are. We don't need a committee to tell us who we are in God. We don't need anybody to tell us who God is and what God has done for us because we know for ourselves. And this is why our personal relationship with God is important. God is the one who will validate you and the plans that he has for your life. So as I pointed out to you in part one this, of this message, this passage in Exodus 19 is a reminder to us that sometimes when we have taken a step in the right direction for our lives, that oftentimes, oftentimes in our lives, the devil will not waste any time launching an attack upon us in an effort to cause us to turn back to the place that we have left. But you should be eager to let this enemy know, this devil know that it doesn't matter what he tries because he's not going to get you to turn away from the place that God has called you to. It's important to understand that God has not only brought us from some places, but God has taken us to some places. There is a promise that God has for our lives and we must stay committed to the promise. We must be faithful in the process of God working on us. We got to know that God is working on us, that God is taking us somewhere, that God yet has his hand in our lives. Amen. And that we are not, we got to have the mindset that we're not going back to where God brought us from. Amen. So we're not going to turn back to the place that he's called us from. Why? Because the enemy of your life does not want you, uh, does not want to see you continuing to move forward in the things of God. See, we must understand that we're going to be tested by the enemy many times, as I've said to you before, just to find out if we mean business about God's direction for our lives. Do we mean business about where God is taking us? Are we passionate about what God is doing in our life? Because if you don't mean business, many times the attacks that the enemy will launch upon your life will indeed cause you to return to that same place of bondage that you left. You ever seen somebody who it seems that God has blessed them to come out of a terrible place? You look and you turn around, you find them to be right back in the place that God brought them out of. And it's not that they had to go back, it's just that they wasn't focused on going forward. Can I say that again? It's not that they had to go back where they were, it was just that they were not focused on going forward. You see, if we're not focused on what God is trying to do in our lives, we will get caught up in what used to be going on. This was the mindset of the Israelites in the wilderness. They kept uh, talking about the wilderness. What happened in the wilderness? Even though they were in a place of being slaves, they still thought about Egypt. And so we've got to understand, we've got, we got to change our mind. We've got to change our mind about where we're going. We've we got to get some excitement about where we're going. What we believe God is doing in our life. Don't know, don't cause... Let anyone cause you to turn back. Jesus. You got to have the mindset that I'm not going back to what I left. Right. So you see, one of the things that will help us to get through the tests of the wilderness is simply to remind ourselves of what God has already done for us. Yes. And I know everybody under the sound of my voice, every, everyone in this building, Amen. Know that God has done something for you. Amen. Sometimes we can forget those things because of what's happening in the present moment. Sometimes we're not as thankful as we ought to be. But God has still been good to you. I don't even have to ask you. 
I know that God has been good for the simple fact that you're here, that you're breathing, that you walk in by yourself. Nobody rolled you in. You are, God has blessed your life. And you got to learn how to tell God, thank him for what you've already done. Oh, my God. you got to have the mindset. God, I'm going to praise you even in my wilderness. Even though, God, I had not got to that place that I know you're taking me. God, I'm going to celebrate you even in the wilderness because, God, you've already shown me your hand in my life. Oh, my God. You've already shown me, God, that you are here for me. And that I can count on you. Anybody glad that they can count on God? Oh my God. Now you can't count on people too much. Come on somebody. You know people will turn their back on you. They'll, they'll tell you they're with you. Oh my God. You look around you see their backside. But not with God. Because God said I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He promised. And God is not a man that he should lie. God said it. God will do it. Yes. Oh my God. And so this is the mindset that we got to have. We got to know uh, that God is good. And God, that God has been good. And that there are so, so many more good days ahead of you. Oh my God. I come to prophesy to you today. That there are some good days ahead of you. Yes. Good days. Oh my God. I know it don't feel like it right now. But there's some good days that God has ahead for your life. And you got to learn how to praise him while you're on your way. you got to learn how to celebrate even in the wilderness. Even when the devil would rather you cry, you got to lift your hands high anyway and tell God, thank you for what you've done for me. God, I give you praise because it didn't have to be as good as it is. Oh my God. God just has been good. And this is the this is what we gotta have. This is the mindset we gotta have. And we gotta keep on that helmet of salvation that causes us to think right. Causes us to have a mind to tell him thank you and give him the glory that he deserves in our lives. When I come to tell you that God deserves the glory in your life, he deserves your praise. All of his mercies. That he extends to us daily. Bible lets us know that his mercies are new every day. Oh my God, his mercies kept some things uh, from coming on you that could have caused you some issues in your life. His mercy and his grace was present in your life. Sometimes God is so good. You know how sometimes in your life you can be so good to people that they take you for granted. Oh, I know somebody know what I'm talking about now. You can be so good to people that they will expect you to do what you're doing and, and you know how to do it. See, see, that's what we forget sometimes with God. And God doesn't have to do what he does. God doesn't have to touch you and wake you up in the morning. He doesn't have to, next, your, to allow your next breath to come up out of you. God doesn't have to do anything. And so you want to learn how to thank, thank him. Just like you wish uh, for people to thank you when you do things that you don't have to do. Nobody likes to be take for, taken for granted. Am, am I right about it? And I want you to know that we are not unlike God. He don't like us to take him for granted. This is the reason uh, that he called Moses in Exodus 19. Exodus the 19th chapter. And, and told Moses uh, to remind these people these children of Israel, that you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Your enemy, the ones who had enslaved you. He told Moses, he called out to Moses and said, tell those people you have already seen what I did. Jesus. Now when you've seen it with your own eyes, oh my God, one, once upon a time they saw manna drop out of heaven. God fed those people in the wilderness. So God said, you've seen what I did. Nobody, nobody have to convince you. You know for yourself. He says, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Oh, my God. You see, one of the things that will help us to get through the test of the wilderness is simply to remind ourselves of what he has already done. 
So I want to give you a little hint on what to do the next time that you experience situations in your life that test your faith in God. When it seems like you're in the wilderness. When it seems like there is a struggle that you cannot seem to get yourself self out of. I want to give you a hint on what to do. I want you to stop and take a good look around for a moment and remind yourself of where God has brought you from. You're no longer in Egypt. You're no longer dealing with what you used to deal with. Yes, the wilderness is not the best place. But yet it is a place Watch this, that signifies progression. I don't want you to miss that. Wilt, the wilderness uh, it is not the best place. Sometimes uh, the situations that we are in, they, they're not the best place. But yet, it is a place that signifies that we have made some progress. That there is some progression that is taken forth, uh, taking place in our life. Now, I know that without a doubt, if any of us looked around in our own lives, we would find some signals of progression. If we would evaluate our own situation, we'd find some signals of progression in our life. So my advice to you is learn to praise God for the progression in your life. After you have been reminded where God has brought you from, You've got to know for yourself that God didn't bring you this far to leave. I just want to give you some hints here. God did not bring you this far to leave you. It's the fact that he's brought you to where you are because you didn't get there by yourself. It's a signal that God is still with you. The fact that you're here. So understand uh, there is some progression that has been made in your life. You cannot let the devil tell you no different. Amen. Amen? You can't let the devil tell you no different that there has been some progress in your life. Now, the next point that I want to make to you is this. Many times we don't understand that the tests that God allows us to enter into in our lives are usually connected to a promise. And I want to walk slow right there because it's important that you get this point. Usually, the test that God allows us to enter into in our lives, usually they are connected to a promise, but we got to get through that test. This is the reason that we must learn how to pass the test of the wilderness. So I need you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say to you. Because I want you to understand the connection of the wilderness times in your life are oftentimes connected to the promise that God has for your life. Now, I want you to understand Israel's situation for a moment to help you to understand the point I'm trying to make in your life. And here it is. First of all, understand that Egypt equals the bondage, or rather it represents the bondage that the children of Israel had to endure. That's number one, I want you to get that point. Number two, the wilderness of Sinai that they entered into equals or represents their connection or their test. And then Canaan, which is what the place that they're on their way to, represents their promise. I want you to hear me. So you got Egypt, their bondage, you got Sinai, their connection, and you got you got Canaan, the promise. So we must understand that the destination for the children of Israel when they left Egypt was Canaan, their promise. But the only way that they could get to Canaan from where they were is that they had to first go through the wilderness. So with that, I need you to understand three very important things about this passage, about what it is saying to us in verse 1. First, we understand from this passage that God's people left their place of bondage 
Secondly, they entered into the test, that connection. And thirdly, that the test they entered into was connected to their promise. So they left Egypt, entered into a test, entered into that place that connected them to their promise. I hope you're with me here. You see, here is a very important thing that I want you to recognize. And that is that oftentimes the test that we have entered into in our lives, once again, we got to get this, is that they are connected to our promise. Now, if you could keep that in mind when you go through your next test, when you go through the next thing in your life that seems as if it's hard, if you recognize that there is something ahead of you that you go thank God for that you passed the test over. You're going to thank God that you didn't give up in the middle of the test. That you didn't quit in the middle of the wilderness. That you didn't die in the wilderness. Because your place in the wilderness is connected to the promise that God has for your life. Now, I want you to also recognize, as we look again at verse number four in Exodus, Exodus 19, because this is a very, very, very important point that I want to emphasize, to re-emphasize here in Exodus 19. Because in verse four, we see here that all along, in all that God was allowing Israel to go through, watch this, is that he was bringing them to himself. Watch what verse 4 says again. As he's told uh, Moses to say this to the people of Israel. He said, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings. And here it is. And brought you unto myself. So the thing that I want you to see is oftentimes God takes us through things in our lives for the explicit purpose of of bringing us unto himself. In other words, sometimes God will allow things in your life because there are certain things that if he allows in your life, it'll cause you to pray when you wouldn't have prayed before. Sometimes when we come into the wilderness, we'll pray uh, like we wouldn't pray otherwise. So this is why God has to allow uh, the rain sometimes, if you will, so we can appreciate the sunshine that God has for our life. Sometimes, I want you to understand that sometimes the thing that you go through, sometimes the wilderness place that you go through actually represents the mercy of God. Why do I say that? Because it was God's mercy on your life to allow you to endure what you're enduring so he could bring you to himself. That's what he says there in verse 4. That's what he said. He said that, that he bared them on eagle's wings. And brought them to himself. In other words, he let them suffer a while. This is why we know from the scripture that the godly, come on somebody, shall suffer persecution. We who live godly, that's what the Bible says, shall suffer persecution. Why does God say that? You that live godly, we that live godly, the Bible says, shall, didn't say might, says, shall suffer persecution. You see, understand this. There's always a purpose in why God does what he does. Why would God let you suffer persecution? Why would God let you go through what you're going through? Why would God let you sometimes endure some pain? Because that's the thing that will bring you to himself. Is anybody with me today? That's the thing that will cause you to pray and say, God, help me. And sometimes that's all God want to hear. You cry for help. He want to hear you cry out, help me God. Because you're in a place that you know you need to hear from him. You ought to thank God for some of the places you've been in that turned you to God. There are some folks that will be in jail today. If, if God had helped them in that place. That caused them to reach out to him. Some of us have made some promises. God, if you get me out of this, oh my God. How many people done lied to God? Oh my God. They said, God, if you get me out of this, look, God, I won't turn away from you. God, I'll stay with you. God, I'll be in church. I'll be faithful. I'll pay my tithes. I'll give my offering. God, if you just get me out of this. 
And just as soon as God bears you on the wings of the eagles and, and blesses you like he's been blessing you, you go back to Egypt. Jesus. You go back to what God brought you out of. You see, you see, sometimes we have a short memory. And we, we forget the promises that we made to God. We forget how he's blessed us. We forget that we promised God, God, I'm never going to leave you. God, I, I'm, I'm not going to do it anymore, God, because you brought me out of this. But we go right back Jesus. to doing what we used to do. We go right back to Egypt. And we don't have to go there, but we, some, we just make the choice. Because we don't, we don't place the right value on uh, the progression that has been made in our life. And so we've got, we've got to, to understand uh, that God does what he does. He allows what he allows often in our lives uh, to bring us to himself. Oh my God. And, and so this is what we got to understand in the midst of the wilderness. So I want you to turn with me again. If you very quickly, and I already see that I'm not going to uh, be able to get to the place that I want to, or desire to get to in this message, but I want you to turn with me uh, back to Deuteronomy for a moment, because I want to show you here uh, why God mentions uh, the eagles in the scripture, uh, mentions bearing them on eagle's wings. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verses 9 through 12. One well, of the scriptures we read at the beginning of the message. Watch what the scripture says here. It says in verse 9 of De Deuteronomy 32, it says, For the Lord's portion is his people. It says, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Verse 10, he says, He found him in a desert land. And in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Anybody glad that God kept you? He, he didn't throw you away, he kept you as the apple of his eye. And watch this, here's what I'm getting to, verse number 11. It says, as an eagle stirring up her nest. Now remember he said he bought them, he, he bared them on eagle's wings to do what? To bring them to himself. Watch what verse number 11 says here. It says, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him. And there was no strange God with him. This is just a reminder of here of, of us here in this text. It mentions also in this text this desert land, this howling wilderness. And the scripture lets us know that this is where God blessed them and found them and brought them out of. The Bible says he led them about, instructed them, and kept them as the apple of his eye. And, and the thing that comes to mind, and I'm, I'm, I'm closing here in a moment, but the things that come to, to mind here when I look at this particular passage of scripture, uh, I think about how people will found, find you in places like this, in a desert place, in a howling wilderness, of, of which represents a time of struggle in your life. If you want to get rid of some folks who ain't really your friends in your life, get into a struggle. Jesus. If you want to get rid of some folks in your life uh, that ain't really, really for you, get into a difficult place where you need them. And you'll, you'll find out real quick who they are. But God, did, God didn't do that. The Bible says here that he kept you. Oh my God. He buried you on eagles' wings even though you were in the desert place. You were in a howling wilderness. He didn't just say in this particular uh, uh, scripture, a wilderness. He says a howling wilderness. A place of going through. But God is reminding us that I was yet for you even in that place. And, and so this is uh, what I want you to see today in this particular message, uh, that God is still worthy of all of your praise 
even though you may be in a struggle, even though you may be in a wilderness place, that God still kept you in that place. He didn't give up on you in this place. He, 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 did, he didn't cause you to die in that place. Even though you felt like you were about to die on occasion. The Bible says that he kept you. Not only did he keep you, but he kept you as the apple of his eye. Oh my God. Meaning that he wanted to keep you as somebody special in his eyes. Oh my God. Because God is just that good. He is a good and he's a gracious God who will keep us when nobody else will keep us. Come on somebody. God will keep you Regardless of the mess that you're in and regardless of the mess that you've been through, God will keep you. He says that you're still the apple of my eye. I found you in a desert place, but I, I, I can see past the desert place and I can see what I invested in you. Oh my God. God looks past your place of struggle and God sees what he has invested in your life. I'm so glad that God sees his investment in me. He sees uh, what others can't see. The others who will turn away from you, from you. Others will run away from your struggles. God will run to your struggles because he knows he can bring you out of your struggles. Just as he did in the case of of the Israelites. He brought them out of Egypt into a, a, a desert place because remember the desert place represented their connection to the promise. Remember Egypt the connection and the promise. Egypt the wilderness and Canaan represents the bondage their connection to God and the promise of the place where God was taking them to. So I want you, what, what am I saying to you? I want you to see the connection that, that God has for you and the future and the hope and the plan that God has for you in your life. I want you to see that God has a plan and a purpose. That's what Jeremiah 29 11 says to us, that he knows the plans that he has for us. Amen. To give us a future, and to give us a hope. Oh my God. I don't know about you today, but I'm glad about what God has for me. I made my mind up, I'm gonna be faithful in what God has called me to do. Sometimes, it'll seem like you may have to walk alone sometimes. Oh my God. But as long as you know you're walking with God to a place that he's prepared for your life, the future and the hope, that he has for your life, you can make it. But you've got to learn how to celebrate even in the wilderness. You've got to learn how to celebrate. You've got to learn how to give him praise. You've got to learn how to tell him thank you. You've got to learn how to pray. You've got to learn how to let him know that you need him because God is worthy of all of our praise. I want you to stand up, get ready to pray. Amen. I want to pray for you today. If you're listening by way of social media, those of you that are in this building, I'm praying for you and I'm praying for those even listening on social media. Maybe that person who, who's not listening at this moment but will see this video at a later time. I want you to know I'm praying for you. And, and that God, that even though you may be in a place of struggle in your life right now, who am I talking to? You might be in a struggle in your place, in your uh, in that place you're in right now, but I come to tell you that God does indeed have a plan in the future and a hope for you. It's not a plan of evil, but that he might bring you to himself, as God told Moses to tell the children of Israel. So be thankful, even in the place that you're in. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you now. I believe that God will hear this prayer. If you pray with me sincerely, Turn your heart towards God. I believe God will hear that which you offer him today. Bow your heads and let's pray. Precious Father, I thank you now for this day you have made. I thank you, God, for every person on the sound of my voice, every person in this room, every person listening by way of social media. I pray, God, that you would bless in the mighty name of Jesus. God, that somehow those words that we've tried to share today 
would be an inspiration, oh God, a motivation to those, Lord, who feel like they're in a, a wilderness struggling place, that yet they can look to you, the heels from which come in their help, knowing that our help comes from you. I pray for them now that you would bless them. Give them a mind to celebrate you even when they don't feel like celebrating because you're worthy of the praise. I pray for that individual now who's dealing with issues in their bodies, their homes, and their finances, whatever the case may be. Touch them and bless them in Jesus' name. That person who doesn't know you is a part of their sins. Give them to cry out to you, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Bless them, God. We'll give you praise for it today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We love you. We adore you. We appreciate you. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for placing your mercy in our lives. In the name of Jesus. I give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus. We love you. We glorify you. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you.